Good evening. Uh, thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, we're going to have a few more people squishing into any empty seats that are around, so apologies while that happens, but we want to get going. We have a lot to get through tonight. Um, it is really a pleasure to see all of you here. Um, it's amazing to think that 50 years ago tonight was the opening of this exhibition, New Documents, um, and the book that we're celebrating its publication today. And it's also amazing to think that 50 years ago, it seemed that the entire photography community could fit into two rather small galleries to celebrate the achievement of three relatively unknown and certainly young artists um, in a way that feels somehow like a distant memory. And I don't know if it was an illusion that that was the world back then. I can't say I was alive. But, um, but still, <laughs> um, it certainly was a historic occasion. So whether you are in this room or joining us remotely, welcome. We're really glad to have you uh, with us tonight. I'd like to begin with some well-deserved thanks. Uh, first and foremost to Lee Friedlander, who's somewhere. Uh, thank you. <laughs> I am honored that you're here tonight. I'm honored that you uh, agreed to let us go forward with this because yours was really, I know you were a little skeptical. You liked the mystery, the fact that nobody knew really what was in this exhibition. Um, but thank you for tolerating the project, for your patience with my many questions, and especially for your humor and for the example of your extraordinary art. So thank you so much. Um, to the estates of Deanne Arbus and Gary Winogrand, I also want to extend an incredibly heartfelt thanks. Um, the way in which you have been so generous in your time and your support of this project um, is really deeply appreciated. And you really do serve the legacies of these great artists with distinction. Um, to Jeffrey Frankel, who's also here, um, who represents Lee and the estates of Winogrand and Arbus, Thank you for your steadfast support of this project and also for nudging us maybe a little <laughs> to make sure that we finished everything on time and well, much appreciated. Um, to the many, many artists and colleagues who shared their memories and their inspiration, their insight with me over the course of this, I reached out to probably at least two dozen uh, people who saw the show and that information is really woven into every aspect of this project. Um, I would also like to thank our distinguished panelists tonight, um, Martha Rossler, Todd Papa George, and Max Kozloff, and our moderator, Rob Slifkin. Max especially, because he wrote a review of this exhibition for The Nation in May of 1967. And with his permission, we're not only reprinting that review in the book, but we've asked him to reflect 50 years later on that review and this exhibition, and that is in uh, the book that you'll have. Hmm. So I also would like to thank my colleagues in the, at the museum, to my boss, Quentin Bajac, for his intelligence, his great judgment, and his wonderful sense of balance that makes everything seem possible. Um, in the Department of Publications, they allowed me to increase the page count not once, but twice. That never happens. But they were also convinced that what we wanted to publish was really worth doing. They also are responsible for um, funding the bar that you'll enjoy, um, those of you who are here in the room and upstairs, uh, a little bit later. I'd like to thank Sarah Resnick, our incredibly talented editor. Thank you, Sarah. And to Katie Homans, our equally talented designer of this book. Um, I owe you all a great deal of debt. Thank you. Um, and to Kristen Gaylord, I'm, she's probably helping with something somewhere, but she found gems like this in the archives and helped me weave a much more meaningful story than I would have been able to without her. She's also responsible for a little vitrine display outside that brings together some of this material, so I encourage you to um, enjoy that. To my other colleagues in the Department of Photography, especially Megan Feingold, Tasha Lutek, Marianne Tondé, and Gianna Furia, thank you. And finally, to my colleagues in education who made tonight possible. Thank you all. So, 
This is the original exhibition proposal that John Tchaikovsky submitted in May of 1966. Um, he wrote at the bottom, this exhibition describes the work of those younger American photographers who have adopted the aesthetic of documentary photography and used it toward ends which are fundamentally non-social, non-hortatory, and personal. It's worth reflecting on the significance of that position in 1966, in 1967 when the exhibition opened, and especially perhaps in 1968, a year later. Um, I feel at this moment compelled to privilege facthood and also the straightforward visual language of the documentary aesthetic. It seems to me urgent to promote this abiding respect for facts and to articulate the way in which works of art can be insistently specific, observable, material, um, made at a particular fixed moment in time, and yet significantly, these same works of art can suggest multiple interpretations, even contradictory truths, and our responses to them can change and evolve in time. This institution's deep commitment to research, to the objects themselves, and to the many ways in which we see them is just one of the reasons I love working here. So here's the cover of the book. You may not have held a copy in your hands because they were flown in by plane. Um, but it was a singularly important exhibition, or at least it proved to be. It was organized by a singularly influential curator, John Tchaikovsky, and it certainly featured three singularly talented artists. Um, one of you in this room tonight wrote to me that this exhibition's constituents remain the pantheon in what's left of my reverence for photography. I don't share that limited reverence, for the record, but I deeply appreciate the sentiment that this, uh, that this exhibition's legacy is unique and meaningful. Despite John Tchaikovsky's best attempts, there never was a catalog, and so tonight we are launching the publication that celebrates this anniversary. My introduction will briefly highlight a few elements of the book, beginning with this, the title wall at the entrance to the exhibition. This is a little light slide, but the real thing is outside. We also included Arbus's sketch for the title wall on which she wrote, and since you can't read it, I will, Dear John, I guess I like it best cropped this way, which is to say about equally on either side as much as necessary so they are never quite in the center. D, thanks for the lemonade. And she does two little speech bubbles out of the teenage couple's mouths. The girl says, cut on the dotted line, and the boy says, more or less. In my research at the Center for Creative Photography, I discovered that Winogrand, that who photographed so many openings and events at museums, took only a handful of pictures at the opening of new documents. Um, all of these were of his children, Ethan and Lori, standing before Arbus's title wall, before their little doppelgangers in Arbus's teenage couple. To orient viewers, because this exhibition did take place in two galleries, we used this annotated floor plan as an end paper in the book. And each section of plates in the book, which appear in the sequence that they appeared in the exhibition, opens with an installation view. This was one of the four large Arbus prints on 16 by 20 inch sheets of paper, the first time that Arbus printed at that scale. This was another which inspired one 10-year-old visitor with some marvelously inventive spelling to write, Dear Sirs, in your photography collection, you have two photographs that I protest, one of which was entitled A Young Man in Curlers. I protest this one especially because it mocks today's youth, mainly attacking its manlihood. I regret sending this letter because I enjoyed other parts of the museum very much. And can't make everyone happy. There were three Arbus prints from 35 millimeter negatives, dated 61 and 62, and perhaps a little less predictably, this one from 65, even though perhaps she ran out of film with her square format camera. And this is the most recent exhibition, in image in the exhibition, which was made about a month before the prints were delivered to the museum for printing, for mounting and framing. A little bit about Lee. Lee Friedlander was the youngest artist in the exhibition.
Whoops, are we helping the squeaking noise? That would be good. Um, Friedlander was the youngest in the exhibition at age 32. Winogrand was 39 and Arbus was 43. For the record, Winogrand got two fewer pictures, I mean, sorry, Friedlander got two fewer pictures for reasons I still can't quite understand. I think he only, because <laughs> he was younger. <laughs> um, his certainly strikes me as the most idiosyncratic representation in the show, and when I've asked Lee about this, his response was simply that he trusted John. But this is not to say that there weren't great pictures on view, like this one and this one. It's interesting to note that in 1967, there were already 19 photographs by Lee Friedlander in the museum collection, but only one of them, this one, was also in the show. Lee was definitely young, perhaps a little cheeky, if I might add. His titles to this one include, uh, were Move On to the Next Title Lady, as a sort of scolding title to get people to stop reading titles. And I think critics weren't quite sure what to make of him. Jacob Deshin wrote about him for the New York Times, Mr. Friedlander manages to pinpoint what he wants to show. He has a sharp eye for juxtaposition, for a kind of one-shot photomontage in which subject and reflection combine to make a third image. He shares with Mr. Winogrand a fine sense of humor, but appears to have a more disciplined eye and technique. This one is titled Somewhere Like Washington, D.C., 1960s. So I think it's fair to say that Lee wasn't really interested in tracking down the titles or dates for his pictures in this show. And David Vestal, who wrote about the show for Infinity Magazine, picked up on this youthful indifference. He wrote, Lee Friedlander seems to be spending most of his effort in saying a visual, so what, as darkly as possible. It, I do love that many of the pictures that we now know where and when they were made, and that, that information appears thanks to Kristen Gaylord at the back of the book, um, were mostly noted by the title Street Scene um, in, the, in the exhibition, and a large number of them, like these four, weren't published until now. So Winogrand is the third artist in the show, and you might notice here one distinctive characteristic of the representation of his work is that there was a slide projection. This was not on the checklist. It's barely noted in the press. Um, and we do reproduce the one um, memo about it because there was a fire in that projector, which meant that they had to take it down before the end of the show. More stories on that in the book or if you corner me later. Winogrand was certainly the best known of the three artists, at least in MoMA's program. He had been featured in John Tchaikovsky's first exhibition as director of the Department of Photography in 1963. Um, these, this was part of his installation in Five Unrelated Photographers. Um, but both Winogrand and Arbus, at the time Arbus was working with Alan Arbus, were in Edward Steichen's The Family of Man, and the Arbus duo were also in Steichen's abstraction and photography. So while this moment was certainly um, an important one, it was not that these were the first time these artists were seen. Here you see, and I'll use my pointer, that's Lee's photograph and Gary Winogrand's um, in the exhibition The Photographer's Eye, which took place in 1964. And I think the fact that these were the only three pictures that predate 1964 in the exhibition suggests the fact that to the museum's audience, um, at least, John believed they had some familiarity with his work. But just as these artists were not that well known then, images such as this were not yet iconic. And this publication and this panel, I hope will restore a fresh sense of observation about their work. Whoops. Hmm. I had a lovely picture up that's not there now um, of the exhibition budget, which was really a something to see. And it's outside, so you can look at it then. But instead, I will turn the microphone over first to Max Kozloff, and then to Todd Papa George, and then to Martha Rossler. And Max will, I mean, and Rob will moderate a conversation between us after that. Thank you all for coming tonight. It's really a pleasure to have you here. And welcome to Max. Thank you.
statement. Can you hear me? Yes. What you don't see with your eye, don't invent with your tongue. This is a Jewish proverb that sometimes and sometimes not is of concern to art critics like me. But what I want to say is that although I've often transgressed this rule, I try to keep it within <coughs> limits. Now as to the show, oh, okay. As to the show itself, of which we've seen a wonderful transcript in pictorial terms, I remember the general layout, but I also recall being very confused in response. Partially this was due to the fact that I had, like some others of my colleagues, the difficulty of treating pop art, minimalism, conceptual art, and the like. Photography was a side interest that nevertheless excited me, although I was pretty ignorant of its traditions until this show gradually uh, increased my interest in my involvement with the medium. At the time, I think only a confused response was really in the dock when I went through the show. Uh, I recognized talent, energy, enthusiasm, and the problematics thereof. Uh, I also know too that these photographers had a, a critical future in any outlying dissertation on American visual culture. They also attracted rather short notice criticism from various quarters, particularly uh, with Diane, Diane Arbus, uh, Susan Sontag, for example, as I remember, criticized her for taking advantage of her upper bourgeois middle class position to take advantage to take uh, some rather uh, unfortunate swipes at people in minority status or underclass economic status. Uh, then, as for Gary Winogrand, uh, though this was clearly a marvelously energetic photographer, he was castigated for, among other things, overproduction which he, didn't, he reneged in terms of his responsibility for it by leaving thousands of uh, un undeveloped roles. Now, this of course was a much later criticism, uh, many, some few de decades later, but it indicated that Wingrant himself felt that he was in problematic circumstances. I'll get to that in a moment. In any event, Gradually, as I became more familiar with the work and reflected further upon it, I began to think that there was something quite remarkable that had been bestowed upon us by the enterprising spirit of the curator, Mr. Sharkovsky. And one of the aspects of the problem and the, and the difficulty of response to that problem was the word he himself used in different contexts, the word normal. Now, I think that normal was, in, fire, in fact, key to the understanding of Dean Arbus's work. So what does normal mean for us? What was normalcy? Let us say that there are, a, a list can be developed of synonyms to normal like routine, like recurrent, like uh, recurrent, like uh, uh, habitual, like standard, and so forth. In other words, a kind of a median was established to signify what normalcy might be. Always, of course, a cultural definition, because outside what was normal for one group would not have been the case for another. And gradually, we began to be aware that the notion of the normal, which is ordinarily a rather dull matter, uh, uh, something that is quite familiar to us, uh, was turned around upside down, in fact, 
in our relations or contact with Diane Arbus's work. I thought that the problem that she was presenting to us, the excitement that went with it, had to do with her willful transgression of ordinarily well-kept social barriers uh, and the relativity of the defining word as far as practices and rituals and understandings were concerned within those groups. For example, which proves very little to be sure, a two foot high dining table would not be considered normal from our point of view of scale, but was perfectly relative and appropriate for a group of Russian midgets. They, for their part, would have the trouble in perceiving our, uh, our arrangements, our furniture, our spaces as anything other than overblown and ridiculous. As far as simply the cultural derivation of the word normal as it applies to our being in life, I think that uh, an example comes to mind. We are habitually involved in reading from left to right. It's not an act of nature or something given to us from on high. It's a cultural artifact that had a long history. When we go into Arbus's work in a bit more depth, I think we begin to see that for her, a foreign or distaff or oblique origin of what was normal in one group and not in another excited her to the point where it became seductive. In other words, she was a person who adventurously moved into areas where she could not be understood or understand until finally there came over her whole outlook a curiosity that knew no obstacles. In that curiosity, there was engaged a notion of transfers. She said at one point that normalcy was also, however unlikely outside your own group, a form of likeness too. You brought what you knew to understand or to fail to understand what was unfamiliar to you as a transitory witness, but you came away, at least she did, feeling the strength and the excitement of understanding her own society through the, uh, the, the implications of her own prior experience. Now, one thing that we've learned from her own attitude and uh, diaristic remarks and memos in the book Revelation devoted to her career and life was the feeling that overall we were in a kind of a fantastic area that there was behind people's sayings, doings, and habits a sometimes mythical understanding. She wrote about such magical emblems and ideas as ceremonials of ordinary life that needed to be entered into by uh, a, a, an entrepreneurial spirit like her own. I want to show you not a picture by Jean Arbus, but by one who relates to her history this particular image, I don't know the name of the author. It was published in the January 23rd, 1999 issue of the New York Times. The father is fondly adjusting the suit and the sporty getup of his large son. And within the rubric, you might say, of normalcy, there is a pretended acceptance of everyday life, of a protocol that would be considered normal, but which acts in this particular image 
as a cover-up for the enormity, the disparity between the two individuals, part of their family existence that goes on and could not be concealed. In fact, there was no need for it to be concealed. But what was, in fact, considered necessary, polite and ceremonial, was the rehearsal of what would have been considered a typical American trait. It is preparing one's child for entree into the outer world. Well, the young man's name was Eddie Carmel, and this picture was taken nine years before this one. Another family scene, but of a different content entirely. Here is Arvis dealing with a family that has an enormous heritage of incomprehension, compassion, and alienation, all working together in a dynamic mixture. The contact sheets have been published in Revelation, and they show that among the pictures that she made at different moments in her contact with this family, Eddie, Eddie Carmel, the Jewish giant, and his parents. Most of the others she rejected or didn't use showed the three of them, three of them, the three some parents and their son, holding hands together, looking out, though it was still a sequence that emphasized his colossal stature. But in this particular picture, the one we know, they're separated. And it turns out their son is the object of their astonished and horrific observation. And they look like dolls in comparison to what they have produced, what they have begotten. And it's a picture that, well, simultaneously theatrical, is also realistic, since it wants to get at what was, as it were, reserved and uh, covered up in their relationships. It's a revelation, as it were. And then, suddenly, the mythic character of what Arbus was about is suggested, at least by me, not by her, in this image right here, the Incredible Hulk, a, a, a comic strip that was started in 1962. That is the decade in which our show took place five years later. Incredible Hulk was, in an ordinary way, normal, a young man of no great distinction, but you shouldn't get him angry, because when it happens, he turns into this, well, a monster. And so there was an extra historical subtext to Dan Arvis's uh, inventory of American types. And I think it added to the feeling one has of consequence and frankness that dominates our experience of her work. I next want to talk about Gary Winogrand and the problems and excitements that came from his contact with the medium, his encounters with the world of American life and letters, let me see. Oh, yes. Excuse me for a minute. If if any of you have read into the concerned literature about Gary Winogrand's art and photography, you will have come across the feeling that he himself convicted himself as being a kind of a failure. And this sentiment runs through in a, in a cool but de de degraded way through his self-image as a practitioner and professional. 
Above all, he seems to have confessed to having committed far more effort and attention to the act of photography than it ever netted him by meaningful results. One of his problems, as he himself might have phrased it, was that there, there existed no connection between the genre that he practiced, namely random order street photography, and the apparent goal of achieving a significant or significant images in terms of meaning and import. He could not count on this, given, in fact, the difficulty he had in understanding where he was going without any outright consciousness of what the subject matter of his pictures would be. That subject matter was elusive when you look at what he had done, not necessarily or exclusively the uh, ones that stand in our memory that have been repeated quite often, but rather those pictures which are dense with figures, but distracting images just the same that do not disclose or indicate what was the point of interest or what was incisive about them. Many of them are not incisive. Gary Winogrand at the same time declined to utilize formal criteria as a method by which to judge his work, but at the same time, though often he produced moving pictures that touch your emotions, he could not justify or select those that made finally the major difference to him from an emotional or psychological point of view. Now, if you think of someone who feels himself in such a dilemma, he's got a problem. If I were in his situation, in his shoes, I might find myself saying, I used to be indecisive. Now, I'm not so sure. <laughs> On the other hand, what was fascinating to me, anyhow, in looking at or reflecting upon his overall career is the intensity and the, the consistency of his involvement, his commitment to the chance arena of phenomena that surrounded him when he went out into the streets. And one of his books, he decided that this was not a proper way to introduce his work to the public, even though he was deeply heartfeltly involved with this random and the chaotic and the disordered. So he titled one of his books, Women Are Beautiful. And he was held to account for liking to look at them on the street. Well, this is a moment of value past those earlier conscriptions to look at someone who took upon himself the desire to open up completely to something that could be not be held accountable to human motivation or purpose or desire. In other words, he embedded himself in the deliberately in the in the non-generative incidental, indifferent world of, well, just outer reality. Now, why would a 1960s and 70s photographer, even of artistic ambition such as Winogrand's, do such a thing? It was then, the, the, thinking about the matter, I realized that he had a liaison, as it were, with the tradition of involving chance in modern art. Art since Duchamp introduced to the world around us the idea that pictures as well as objects could be held up to the status of works of art without human volition or purpose 
influencing them and therefore accruing autobiographical or ideological content, which was considered somewhat negative from the point of view of modernist aesthetics. Above all, responsibility and control were too constricting for a, a more difficult but exciting interchange between the work as designated and the, view, and the viewer's baffle of reaction. So I thought, there is a moment when a photographer either outstandingly or inadvertently realizes that he is aligned with a major current of modern sensibility. The fact that the authorship and above all the narrative content of the work no longer has primal interest in our interaction with it. The last photographer, Lee Friedlander, I have a few remarks. I think that he very cleverly and innovatively blended the two traditions that I mentioned so far, that of Diana Arbus, namely her portrait adventurism, and Gary Winogrand's energy and commitment to the whole adventure of losing oneself in the streets. But what Friedlander seems to be to have done is to have blended these genres and their rules and their metrics, as it were, into his own particular visualization of the Americans around, indebted as it might have been at the beginning to a documentarian such as Walker Evans, De Friedlander's work nevertheless took its own course into what I've written as a kind of innovative but unannounced still life attitude or mentality. He accomplishes that reference to still life, that is to say the study of immobile objects, by intensity and con condensation of the contents of the, f of the frame itself, making the frame a constrictive agent that contains almost uh, overexcitable material, whether they be vegetable or human. <clears throat> he does not valorize what he's looking at by referring to the abnormal or the analogous, he accepts the normal, repeats it, and, and leaves it as a tableau of no comment. In the essay I wrote about his work in the book, I speak of him as a loquacious minimalist. And <laughs> this is an interesting contradiction in terms with which I think his work leaves us. Thank you. Thank you, Max. Um, and Todd, if you, if I could invite you up. Todd Papa George. Good evening. Uh, I hope in our panel discussion later on that uh, the moderator will um, ask a few questions about Gary Winogrand's work. I, I profoundly disagree with what I understood Max to be saying. Once I started to think about writing this, I found myself repeating a line of poetry, what mighty contests rise from trivial things. It's Alexander Pope, the second line of Rape of the Lock. I hadn't thought of it for decades, but like a song that won't let go of you, once it get into my brain pan, it lodged there, a brain pain. So I finally conceded to it and let it shape this talk. What mighty contests rise from trivial things. <clears throat> 
Now, if I thought that this event tonight was devoted to a mighty contest, I wouldn't be part of it, and I'll keep to that. I gave up these battles long ago, better to substitute mighty conclusion, which more or less covers both what we're doing here right now and what Sarah and the museum have accomplished by publishing this new book devoted to new documents, which is not only mighty, but also glorious. And needless to say, I don't mean to suggest that new documents was in any sense trivial. But if I had to find a single word to describe the show, it would be modest. Surprising, perhaps, in light of its deserved reputation as a landmark exhibition. But I'm speaking specifically here about the physical fact of it, or more accurately, about everything except the photographs themselves, which were extraordinary and something we can talk about in our discussion. What I'm interested in right now, though, is making another point, one that many of you will probably find too obvious. But as I've indicated, it's my hobby horse right now, the trick my mind is playing on me. So, Imagine yourself walking into MoMA of 1967, early in the run of this show, and being faced in front of you and slightly to the left with a small room. That's where new documents in the form of Dean Abbas's 32 print contribution to the show starts. And I'd guess because my memory is faint on the question, it's also where John Tchaikovsky's wall label for the show is placed. But you want a cup of coffee, so before looking at or reading anything, you head toward the cafeteria by walking down an empty corridor that starts by the entrance leading into Deanne's room. At the end, you turn right and pass through a room that might still be fairly described as somewhat corridor-like. This is where the rest of New Documents is hanging in the form of 62 prints of Lee Friedlanders and Gary Winogrands strung an inch or two apart in clothesline fashion, except in Gary's case, where some of the prints are arranged in double rows. All in all, difficult to see one picture to the next, and difficult to catch a breath one to the next. You want that coffee, though, and continue on straight for the cafeteria. But to exit this room, you have to maneuver your way around a tall white pedestal or plinth you haven't seen there before, which is serving as the base for a slide projector now casting color pictures 10 to 15 feet onto a wall above and in front of you. You discover these are slides of Gary Winogrand's, probably 80 of them, assuming the carousel is full, but thinking only of that coffee, in fact, that's why you came to the museum, which you finally admit to yourself, you move on to the cafeteria, never imagining that in a few weeks, when you return to the museum specifically to see these pictures along, the rest, along with the rest of new documents, you'll be out of luck. Because in the interim, one of the slides in the tray got caught, starting a small fire and finishing off the color portion and a major part of the exhibition. So when you do return to the museum, you think, I'll get the catalog for the exhibition and have the pictures that way. But again, you're out of luck. Debbie Downer, the psychologist talked to Debbie Downer. <laughs> there is no catalog. Unlike the following year, when you're able to buy the book accompanying the 1968 Versailles exhibition, hung in the same space, or in 10 years when you're able to pick up the catalog published in conjunction with public relations, an exhibition of Winogrand's also hung in that space, proving that shows placed along the walk to the cafeteria don't necessarily suffer from a catalog preventing curse. Now though, without a book, you return to the room where John Tchaikovsky's wall label for the show is hanging, although I'm still not sure that's where it actually was. One reason you want to read it is because you're curious about the title he selected for the exhibition. As a photographer, which I've decided you have to be, you're cautious about words like documents and documentary. In fact, the only time you ever hear anyone say them is in connection with Walker Evans's phrase, lyric documentary, which happens to be fairly off, often because the phrase is so useful. Uh, Evans himself remarked that when I added lyric to documentary, I had the quality I was after. 
By acknowledging photography's elemental dependence on seemingly literal facts, while trading on the association of the word lyric with the act of singing or for classicists playing a stringed instrument called the lyre, the phrase provides a kind of poetic cover for you and the photographers you know, most of whom consider themselves artist photographers, or as Evans called them, non-commercial photographers. Exhibitions need titles, though, and this one has new documents, which has the virtue of looking both forward to the forever new and back, as I see it, to photographic documents of a past sometime before the publication of Robert Frank's 1958 book, The Americans, a powerful example of self-assigned artistic expression. As well as being a book that informed the pictures of the three participants in this show, and effectively changed how many serious photographers at that time would think about their ambitions for their work, which is by way of stressing how intensely self-directed the new documents photographers were at the moment when the show was put together, as if we needed any proof apart from their pictures. And with that, how little, if anything, of what they were after had to do with notions of documents or documentary. As I've just indicated, Walker Evans co-opted those words with his sly phrase, apparently in the 1930s. Then 20 years later with the Americans, Robert Frank drained them of relevance. When you now read John, Ch John Tchaikovsky stating in the wall label, quote, in the past decade, a new generation of photographers has directed the documentary approach toward more personal ends, quote, it seems as if he's describing a train rushing by him. As of course he realized, because John knew everything worth knowing. Not to mention that over the next 20 years, he provided the shaping critical intelligence driving younger photographers, generations of photographers, including mine, onto their individual versions of lyric photographic poetry. Back to that room, though, where Dion 32 photographs are hanging separated by an empty corridor from Friedlanders and Winogrands. Physically, for her, a solo exhibition, which, as it turned out, was pretty much how the photographic press at the time responded to the entire show. Easy enough to understand, I suppose, given the subject matter of her photographs and, of course, their quality. However, it did seem to me at the time that press commentary on the exhibition was written by people who, once they made it out of Diane's chamber, were more interested in the cafeteria than they were in the extraordinary photographs lining the walls on their way to it. I was a 26-year-old photographer then, and a close friend of Gary Winogrand's, so I wasn't what you'd call a disinterested observer, which isn't to suggest that a single word of what I've written here relays anything I remember Gary saying or feeling about the exhibition. While he was happy enough to be involved with it, primarily, I think, because of his respect for John Tchaikovsky, the show really didn't mean much more to him than that, if we ignore the effort required to produce the prints for it. As illustration, here's a story I was told about a master class that took place at Richard Avedon's studio during the exhibition. Marvin Israel, who was acting as interlocutor that evening, asked Deanne if she agreed that new documents represented an exclamation point in her career. She said yes. Then Marvin turned to Gary and asked him if in his case he agreed, to which Gary replied, no, a comma, only a comma. Another memory, Deanne in the room where her pictures were exhibited, which she visited almost daily, listening intently to what people had to say about her work and writing it down in a notebook testifying, it would seem, to the truth of her answer to Marvin Israel's question. So, now I've complained, or seem to, about the location, the hanging, and the title of new documents, not to mention the press coverage. Puzzling, I know. Remember that hobby horse, though. For what I've been actually trying to do with all of this verbal misdirection and clangor is simply to suggest, I'm sorry, to suggest something about the distance between what I've called the modest physical reality of that 1967 exhibition, which I believe is worth remembering, and what might be called the psychic size of it today, when New Documents is now properly regarded as a major groundbreaking show, in spite of the cramped exhibition area, 
the mechanical breakdown of the slide projector, an incurious critical press, and until tonight, this happy night, 50 years later, the lack of a significant institutional record of the show. Speaking of which, new documents also proved, of course, to be a very big feather in the cap of its curator magician, John Sharkovsky, who pulled out of that same cap three photographers time has confirmed to be great artists. John Tchaikovsky, the astonishing eye and mind behind it all. Back now, though, to the beginning. This difference I've tried to describe between a physical thing and the myth that time often makes of it is analogous, I think, to the jumble of being a photographer out in the field, weighed down with cameras, and full of dull or excited thoughts, hoping for a picture that might make the day and the effort and all of the self-denials required just to get in place, ready and spurred, worth it. Analogous, I say, to the modesty or physical actuality of all of that, and so far away from it, the captured beauty of the achieved thing, the photograph carried off from that day to be finally hung on a wall or printed on a page. For you, the photographer who made the picture, a landmark in and of itself, and traced within it a partial coded record of its modest beginning. As the poet wrote, what mighty contests rise from trivial things. Leading me to nine pictures I made back then around the time of new documents of a few photographers relevant to all of this for the most part, in the field and at their posts. Oh, this is a little out of order. This is Robert Frank, uh, who I, th I think is appropriate to, to include him in this uh, little slideshow, uh, on the film set of Me and My Brother in Brooklyn. These pictures are all uh, taken at just the time of uh, new documents. And there I am. Uh, could, could you this light be turned off? Uh, there I am, six months before that. This should have been the first picture, actually. Uh, in a hotel room in Spain, uh, sick with a bad cold, uh, drinking gaseosa, and uh, reading uh, Don Quixote. <laughs> this is six months before I came to New York. And actually, I met Robert Frank before I met Gary Winogrand, but let, it's about six months before I moved to New York. And here's Gary, uh, all duded up for uh, an advertising assignment uh, at just about the time that I knew him, when I first knew him. So again, in 1967. And here he is, moments after doing what? Taking one of his more uh, famous photographs. You see him there on the left with the camera, cigarette in hand. And there's Lee, who doesn't look a day older tonight. Lee, stand, show us, show us. <laughs> and uh, Deanne in Central Park. Uh, with her modus operandi there. Um, I, th I think you all, looking at these pictures, the actual physical act of being out in the world, being a photographer, uh, I think they convey that. Certainly the, the sense of time helps and the, the fact that, of who these people are also help. But it's, it's very powerful to me. And here's Deanne, uh, the same day in the park, photographing a couple of kids same kids, and here are Gary and Deanne in the museum at the time of new documents uh, on the phone together. Uh, as I say here, as I write, all actual people doing a real and very difficult thing before it turns to myth. Thank you. Thank you, Todd. And now Martha Rossler. <laughs>
my God. I'm, I'm going to have a lot of problems with that light. I'm sorry. I didn't bring my sunglasses. Uh, I'm really serious. You can hear me, though, right? OK. Um, uh, I guess nothing's going to Yeah, really. It's, uh, my eyes are really light sensitive. Uh, now I can see you. Hi, Sarah. Um, for something different, I thought I would do uh, a meditation on a text. And uh, I'll begin with the title, New Documents, um, versus, let's say, Old Documentary. Documents are objects. Documentary is a process, often an embedded one. And now to the text. Um, it's the iconic, much quoted text. It's the world label. Most of those who were called documentary photographers a generation ago, when the label was new, made their pictures in the service of a social cause. It was their aim to show what was wrong with the world and to persuade their fellows to take action and make it right. In the past decade, a new generation of photographers has directed the documentary approach toward more personal ends. Their aim has been not to reform life, but to know it. <clears throat> their work betrays a sympathy, almost an affection, for the imperfections and the frailties of society. They like the real world in spite of its terrors as the source of all wonder and fascination and value, no less precious for being irrational. I'm skipping the remarks about the actual photographers, which I will continue to do. What they hold in common is the belief that the commonplace is really worth looking at and the courage uh, to look at it with a minimum of theorizing. These three photographers would prefer that their pictures be regarded not as art, but as life. This is not quite possible, for a picture is, after all, only a picture. But these pictures might well change our sense of what life is like. So just to recap, they like the real world in spite of its terrors as the source of wonder and fascination. Their work betrays a sympathy, almost an affection for the imperfection and frailties of society. And it reaches its denouement. The commonplace is really worth looking at and the courage to look at it with a minimum of theorizing. And again, the last sentence, these three photographers would prefer that their pictures be regarded not as art, but as life. This is not quite possible. For a picture is, after all, only a picture. But these pictures might well change our sense of what life is like. OK. The courage to look at it with a minimum of theorizing, that is, without ideology or fixed interpretation, is consonant with the insistent disavowal of theory or politics by documentations of the 60s working in direct cinema modes, such as Frederick Wiseman and Albert Maisel's expressing horror of ideology and even commentary itself. Sharkovsky's text reiterates the Cold War caveat that real art is not about messages, nor is it thematic, nor is it able to effect change except through consciousness. And finally, the product is a bounded object with no agency or life of its own. I would frame Sharkovsky's task let me be sure I'm in the right order. I would frame Sharkovsky's task in rescuing an artistic strain in photography, a personalized idiosyncratic body of work, as teasing it away from the noise in the channel. Some of the noise is constituted by the photojournalistic mass media from news reportage and glossy commercial color photography. He attended to that urgent task in 1976 with Eggleston, however. A strain of the vernacular, however, turns out to be a bit more problematic. The, re the reams of the commemorative family snapshots are tourist photos, often exhibiting sentimentalism and celebration. The snapshot's naturalism of the commonplace was not acceptable, although Robert Frank's realism teetered on the brink. The allure of the snapshot, however, appealing to institutional gate gatekeepers already in the 60s, What's its apparent authenticity without conscious scripting? 
It recorded an interactive event in which the photographer confronts the audience as one of its own, a point Fred Wiseman later made in reference to his own films. Snapshots can convey a certain unfathomability of human motives in that the photographer's intentions may be recoverable only with difficulty from these archeological artifacts of an unself-conscious world. Two of the photographers in this show are classifiable as snap shooters, if only superficially, of course. The authenticity of the snapshot is differentiable from propaganda and public relations on the one hand, and Gary Winogrand did a book on public relations as we know, and differentiable also from the political certitude of the ideologically driven. Although Sharkovsky doesn't invoke the rhetoric of authenticity or the power of witness, they are certainly implied. Sharkovsky has a faith in the confinement of the work to the four walls of the frame, no matter what the photographer says, a sentiment he expresses more fully in his introduction to Eggleston, where he basically says photographers lie. It's okay. Realism is not a term invoked in the New Documents text, but what is documentary if not a species of realism? Terry Eagleton, following Brecht, writes, quote, artistic realism cannot mean, quote, represents the world as it is, unquote, but rather, quote, represents it in accordance with conventional real life modes of representing it, unquote. The 60s saw, as you see, social upheavals and revolutions. This is just 1967. One of the great changes was the oft-noted rising expectations of the middle class as a result of the extraordinary growth of the economy of the US, the only superpower left standing, economically speaking. The baby boomers' high rates of college attendance, the growing power of consumers, did not forestall the critiques by intellectuals and bohemians of the political repression and saber rattling of the 50s and 60s Cold War America. If this was a prosperous nation with a burgeoning suburban expansion, why was it experienced by so many as a vacuous and conformist nightmare with its unfulfilled subjects in a land of plenty. The upheavals of that era, era by 1967 brought civil rights struggles, political assassinations, war and nuclear crises, a huge student revolt and anti-war mobilizations, a growing counterculture and major uprisings or riots in Detroit, Newark, Minneapolis, Milwaukee and Buffalo in 1967. But let's leave politics aside. However, if we jettison politics and ideology, especially in the 60s, we get sociology. This is not the small town loving, largely pre war, pro Gemeinschaft sociology of the Chicago School of Robert Park, but the urban sociology of David Reisman's lonely crowd with an earlier nod to. Georg Zimmel's metropolis and mental life of the turn of the previous century. A dominant strain of sociology in the 60s is symbolic interactionism, one of whose founders, George Herbert Mead's posthumous collection is entitled Mind, Self, and Society. Symbolic interactionism posits that social interaction creates both, indivi creates both individuals and society and neither can be understood without the other. 60s sociology is also a sociology of social construction. Peter Berger and Thomas Luckman's enduringly influential book, The Social Construction of Reality, a treatise in the sociology of knowledge, was published in 1966. A body of work with greater popular purchase, however, was that by sociologist Irving Goffman. Goffman's dramaturgical approach, so-called, but not by him, to human interaction, particularly in reference to everyday life rather than extraordinary events, introduced the idea of the performance of the self and won him a broad readership in the 1960s. I underline the relevance of this approach to the educated middle class's growing self-understanding 
and I take it as, an, as underlying any serious consideration of Deanne Arbus' work with its focus on the construction of appearance and the role of consciousness in dealing with stigma, the title of one of um, Goffman's most read books in producing oneself as an object of the public gaze, the role of consciousness in producing oneself as an object of the public gaze. Arbus's portraits raise the question whether the people are aware or unaware of the flaws of their performance. I think the flaws are always visible, but in her late career photos of children seemingly with profound degrees of mental retardation, we are shown subjects unconcerned with the management of their appearance. They suggest an Arbus at the telos of her project. This performative frame applies as well to the other New York photographer, Gary Winogrand, stemming from working class Bronx rather than upper middle class Manhattan. But it may be more appropriate to view his work at least partly through the framing lens of Friesman's Lonely Crowd the textbook of urban alienation, um, as I mentioned. Winogrand frequently enacts that alienation by his position within the photographic transaction. More seriously, I note in passing the role in that era within both urban sociology and urban photography, especially in New York, of Jews, often of immigrant background, sensitive to the often unexpressed divisions and exclusions on the basis of class and race, while brought up to respect the importance of critique, often imbued with an immigrant's interest in opportunity, but also exposed willy-nilly to socialist ideas of universal justice. But I would be hard pressed to see any of those motives in Winogrand, whose sometimes bitter cynicism and separation has often led me to think of him as one of the cranky guys from the Bronx and Brooklyn who I always imagined filled the ranks of marauding street photographers. Friedlander brings as leavening a Northwest Coast formed small town or suburban sensibility of looking at stuff in passing and surprise perhaps, but without the invested bite of the other two of urban origin and habitat. Friedlander, if no less alienated than the other two, shows the cooler influence of pop, but also humor, allowing the joke to be on himself as he exhibits a kind of deflated dishevelment, a young self-portraitist exhibiting a transparent failure to manage his image, IRL, by inference or in the produced document. Obviously, there's much more to be said about all these photographers, but I won't. The politics of identity, while a major formation of the late 1960s, compare, for example, the new social movements theorized by Ernesto Laclau and Chantal Mouffe, had not yet become a persistent theme in society or in the art world, especially in photography. The trajectory of the new documents show was toward abjection in the sense of that which provokes a recognition in viewers of a disturbance in identification that consequently unmoors one's sense of identity and one's understanding of the social order. Something staring out at us from Arbus' photos and attested to by the letter from the anonymous 10-year-old. It's here within the sociological and inevitably the psychoanalytic frame where Sharkovsky's assertion that the photographers would like to see their work, would like their work to be seen as life, not as art, finds contemporary purchase. The new documents show established the foundation for a new drastically restricted canon largely on the basis of exclusions. We've read the differentiation from the political from the critical observations of documentarians bent on social change or even on revealing the living culture of urban working class people of whatever color or ethnicity. And there I refer specifically to the Workers Film and Photo League, later the Film and Photo League. And it does not acknowledge what a middle term such as street photography or even what mass market photo books might offer. The efforts here instead were to relocate the practice of documentary or even a photography to corps, 
within the confines of modernism at the very moment that the certainties and boundaries of modernism were growing imprecise and the understandings of photography as resident within them was subjected to an increasingly insistent contestation while the documentary practices themselves were reappropriated as the self-representation of suppressed and excluded others. Jorge Ribalta suggests documentary exists as a fragile compromise between the aesthetic, the communicative, and the epistemic conditions of photography, and as, quote, the intersection of the discursive spaces of the medium, the archive, and the media. Thank you. Thank you, all three of you, for your papers. I think it might be, um, oh, is this on? Yeah. I think it might be helpful just to begin uh, talking a little bit about the concept of the document, which is something, Martha, that you, I think, very um, compellingly um, and provocatively suggested that somehow the concept of the document in Sarkowski's hands um, was a way to align, and tell me if I'm summarizing your argument correctly, align this strand of photography with the tradition of modernism. And I'm thinking even uh, about um, how at this moment art, like minimal art, is often talked about as literal, um, that there was a kind of sense that, right, there, there's a sense that, e that art, it, um, kind of a, the dominant form of art in the mid-60s itself had a certain kind of documentary, non-fictional aesthetic that Sarkowski was trying to um, perhaps align his, his work, uh, this work with. It's, I'm, and I'm saying that it's a two-pronged question that I think all, I would be curious to hear all three of you respond to, which is both what is the relationship between these photographers' work and a concept of the document or documentary photography, which is a slightly difficult or complex question, um, but I also what is the relationship between this work and the larger body of art, visual art that's being produced at this moment? I, all three of you um, made reference at various times to pop, minimal. Um, I remember, Max, in your review in The Nation, you begin actually aligning this work with new American cinema. And I, you know, I'm thinking of things like probably Easy Rider or Bonnie and Clyde, perhaps, or The Graduate might be the sort of films you were thinking of. And I just, uh, maybe, you know, is there a kind of documentary style that we see in the larger artistic practice? And what, what, was, um, what was new about these documents? Or were they not even documentary photography at all? I think I answered that. <laughs> I, I went on at length about... Uh, the notion of the word documentary and what it might have meant. I can't speak for Lee, of course. I can't speak for Deanne, but I think I can speak for Gary. We were such close friends. And it's not a word that ever occurred to him to describe his work. Um, and he certainly didn't feel any kind of debt to the classic documentary photographers of the 30s. In fact, I remember John had hung a show of uh, Dorothea Lang's maybe the year before. And Gary, not, not dis disrespectfully at all, but he simply was not interested. Uh, he, in other words, I, I think, uh, uh, Martha used the word modernist. I think if, if there is a word that, you know, one could use to sort of categorize Gary's ambition, not that he would have used it, but was, it was modernism. He was, he was following up on the, uh, the great uh, pioneering example of, of uh, Robert Frank, who was looking at Walker Evans's pioneering example, and uh, applying that kind of frame to uh, 
uh, being out in the world and making pictures. I think John's descriptions at the, at the end of the uh, label that, that Martha was reading, uh, I don't know that Gary would have subscribed <laughs> to very much of that at all, showing life as it is or, uh, no. Uh, maybe Leah has something to say about that, but uh, um, it, was, it was definitely, it was about photography and Gary trusted his native Bronx Jewish uh, existence as a vibrant uh, physical force in the field of life to sort of carry that part of the meaning to it. But the, the shaping aesthetic uh, form was photography and in effect, to some degree, the lessons that John was beginning to teach, although I think at that point, John was learning at least as much from Gary as Gary was learning from John. I, I think I actually have never considered whether this is documentary. It's not at issue for me. If you want, as a curator, to say this is documentary, that's fine. I would say there are many types of work that fit under that rubric. This is not my documentary, but I don't disclaim it as work that fits within John's binary of mirror or window. Obviously, it's not just a mirror, though we could sort of nudge Diane Arbus's photos in that direction rather easily. But I, it's, it's about disciplinary boundaries, and I think modernism is the essential work here, and the idea that photography, of course, is separate from other modes of enunciation through images. Uh, as I said, the end of the 60s was the period precisely in which that distinction seemed to be collapsing. And a whole bunch of us resurgent, nasty, critical types felt that's not our documentary because we were what was called the 60s generation. Um, yes, that's your label. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know that anyone else can read it. Um, it's funny who gets labeled by political leanings and who doesn't. Um, but the, the issue is, I, I, I just wanted to say something I took out of my paper because it seemed just a bit snarky, which is I'm always struck when MoMA refers to itself as MoMA because you would never have said that in polite company at the time. The Museum of Modern Art was always the modern. Yeah, I'm no longer Marxist. Um, uh, because now we are no longer modern, and we can say we have never been modern, perhaps. Uh, but the fact is that, of course, we are running like hell away from the idea of the modern. We've already leapfrogged over it to postmodernism, and then the contemporary, contemporary, whatever the hell that is. But I'm leaning on this now just to bring you back to that moment when being the modern and the, as I called it, the Kremlin of modernism was the most influential position there could be. I referred to John in my intemperate essay as the czar of modernism and I would stick by that description as referring to the very moment we're describing. I hear the definition of the document or documentary as an object, a statement, an act even, that testifies to something. It's a broad definition. And it would apply to the photographers we're considering this afternoon, but does not include many interests of theirs that exceeds the category and the genre we associate or identify as documentary. They're not airtight compartments, that is to say, documentary fidelity on one hand to something that exists and artistic needs to do personal, personal involvement in the image. In any event, as a writer and commentator upon these matters, I, I have to recognize that I'm somewhat anti-authoritarian so that, for instance, instead of 
the, the, the language we call the Ten Commandments, I would prefer the Ten Suggestions. <laughs> Uh, before we open uh, up questions to the audience, I, I would just want to follow up on something you said, Todd, about the kind of mythic nature of this show. And I, I would like just to hear more about how all of you saw this show or see this show. Again, there's always the question of being there in the retrospective uh, mytholo myth myth mythology that has accumulated around it. But um, was this show a kind of a summary of emerging trends because there was, we, we talked, uh, Sarah, you began showing the five young um, photographers and there was a show at the George Eastman House, the um, American Landscape. There was a sense that, uh, there social, social were, towards a social landscape, <laughs> excuse me, that's right, uh, that there were, there were other photographers bet besides these three that were exploring this new social landscape. Um, there seems to be, a, a, you, you, maybe you, Martha, mentioned the humor in Friedlander, and I think there, there's a humor, there's a certain irony in a lot of these works that seems distinctive. I, so I, I'm curious just to hear you speak about how distinctive these photographers w were in terms of the larger moment in 60s photography. I mean, I, I saw one of the most remarkable facts as I was looking through the exhibition history of MoMA in the 60s was there was a Jerry Yulesman show hanging simultaneously at the same moment of new documents, just to suggest a very different approach to photography. Um, and then Bill Brandt had a show the year before. So there, there were other pra practices that weren't like this, but then Elliot Erwitt had a show, which I think his work would look very good within the new documents. I removed him from my paper oh. um, because I, I wanted it the time down. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's embarrassing to say because the one photographer the yeah. one photographer who's here yeah. is the one about whom I wrote an actual essay, because that's Lee Friedlander, uh, a substantive essay as opposed to a review, because I found his work the most compelling. It's embarrassing because you're here. If you weren't here, I wouldn't be embarrassed to say these things. Um, <laughs> happy to say them, but it looks sycophantish. It's not intended. Um, I, I found them the most different in intent and purchase and the most generous in terms of the little games he played with his viewers um, and uh, the image and himself positioning himself. Uh, I, I would say if I had to that it was kind of what I would call street photography, but who, who cares about labels? Um, uh, was that interesting? Well, it was interesting if you were interested in what got the imprimatur of the official at the home of official imprimaturs, which is, you know. But I mean, there were other f shows of street photography at the modern, right. in the 60s. I mean, right. I'm, I'm trying to maybe consider. W were any of them called documents? Right, mm -hmm. what is it? I mean, was it the title? Was it Tchaikovsky's grouping? And that, that you know, they, one of the, another remarkable fact about this exhibition is it's, it's this mythology exists even though there was no catalog. Sarkowski's comment was just in a brochure, right? And everyone who writes about this. It was a this, wall label. It was a wall label. You, it wasn't even a brochure, yeah. right? So, but, but that wall label made uh, tremendous claims. Right. It's, it went like that to a whole generation and tradition of documentarians. And although we can certainly look for antecedents in the work of Robert Frank, who can, who is like the hinge between the documentary that is allied with some point of view or group or outlook and that which looks as though it was made by a solitary self, nevertheless, Frank's book was clearly received as critique it showed us things we did not want to see, and those things were based on race and class, the two unmentionables in US society at the time. So to claim that these are the new documents that erase that history of investedness was concerning to people like me. Even though I think one could argue that race and class are visible in these photographs. All three photographers, oh, I think, yeah, address. But if you read the text, right. it doesn't matter. 
because the they're text, just the text pictures. isn't the show. The the show is the photographs, of course. I just, used to just, think that until I got to be an adult and realize that the text and the catalog are generally much more, and the reviews are much more important than the show, which I find dreadful. I mean, it is true that when, whenever you, whenever you- I didn't you, say then the work, yeah. I said then the show. Oh. oh, it's true that whenever you read a, a general assessment of these three photographers, they cite this show and they quote that wall label. So it has, very much influenced the way we see these works. And it, it, well, the, the wall label was the only thing, as we pointed out, that existed, really, as, you know, I, as a... As a I, th I think there's still a, a residue of the show. There's a lot of work that remains to be done to point out the politics of these photographs that, is, that I think are absolutely as apparent as um, Robert Frank's. But right. Well, if you, as, as long as you're talking about the politics of the photographs and not the politics of Tchaikovsky that led to the selection of these three photographers, yeah. because I think that politics is clear. It's the politics of quality. <laughs> Sorry. I mean, Tchaikovsky recognized something uh, unique in these three, and I think Trime has proven hi uh, him absolutely correct as uh, that anonymous uh, uh, emailer to Sarah uh, was suggesting. Uh, when, when I look back, I can't think of I can't think of another photographer that was excluded that should have been in the show with these three, but I guess that's my personal opinion. Arthur, would you like to comment? No. Why don't we open this um, up to the audience for a moment? Um, yes. Are, is there, are there microphones, or people should just um, speak out loud? Yes. I, I guess so. Yeah. Oh, no, there, there, yeah there's um, I was just going to say that the. One thing that didn't come up really in any of the language tonight is that these were American artists making American photographs of American subjects. And how does that relate to the subsequent narrative around this exhibition and its reception and its legacy? The hegemon. <laughs> I think I have something to say. Sure. About, I have something to say about that. <clears throat> In retrospect, we can say that all three of those distinguished artists were aggregationists in that they were expansive, including many topics that were either ignored or under prejudice or shaded from public parlance, and they were, to a certain extent, criticized for their involvement with groups that were outside or even divisive as far as the general culture was concerned. They were, Arpis was convicted of being a voyeuristic or voyeur type photographer as if looking at beyond your horizon was somehow rather critical or criminal even. I think that facts played a role in their outlook from a realistic point of view, but they were also, in their own 60s fashion, somewhat hard-edged and descriptive, as well as poetic and self-indulgent. Also, I think you can look at Dion Arbus's position vis-a-vis -vis the family of Ban in 1955, the show here at the museum, which was a show that try to indicate that we were all alike across many cultures that existed across geography and learning and habit. So we were forced to endure and engage with the severe trials of life threatening our mortal prospects. Well, that was a noble ambition, but hers, I think, especially from the viewpoint of politics today, are shown to have their own merit, her own, her own attitude towards the polis, namely that everyone was different. How could it not be that they were other than us? How could it not be that we would be impressed or uh, in some attempt to understand what that possibly could mean and if you were using photographs, how to work it that way? I think that stands out today. Uh, I think they, they are American in, 
if only in the fact uh, of their embrace of the fact, I guess this is uh, expanding a bit on what Max said. Uh, going back to Walker Evans and his, uh, his embrace of the actual literal reality of the physical world around us, which was not characteristic uh, of European photography at the time. I remember uh, Gary Winogrand, who uh, deeply admired uh, Cartier Bresson, at the same time felt that there was nothing for him to learn from uh, the Decisive Moment, which was published in 1952. And this, this does not have to do with one's feelings about humanity or such things. It had to do with, with, with a photographer, in this case, Winogrand, uh, who was adapting his mode of working to very wide-angle lenses, which he saw as a very interesting problem to have to deal with, and which aligned itself with this notion of photography being a, uh, an incomparable record keeper, physical, literal record keeper, lens described record keeper of the physical world. And that was the challenge to him. So yeah, there is a certain kind of humanity in it, just as I suppose there's a certain kind of inhumanity in uh, Dean Arbus turning, uh, perhaps at John Tchaikovsky's suggestion, suggestion to the uh, twin lens reflex camera and giving up the sort of more vaporous, uh, grain-filled structures of her earlier 35 millimeter uh, pictures, which you could have seen earlier this year in a great show at the Whitney. Um, and... Uh, at the Met. At the Met. I'm sorry, scoozy, scoozy. Yeah, the bro the broy or something or other. <laughs> and, uh, and Lee also, uh, turning to wide-angle lenses. Now, to people who aren't photographers, that doesn't sound like much, but in a way, it's the whole thing. It's the whole package. As I said, we step out into the world. We're individual people. We have our own individual sense of that world and the meanings that, that it might project to us uh, and our sensibilities. And the medium, the literal thing between us and that world and that perception is the camera. So every adjustment that's made with a camera, in effect, redefines the aesthetic of that photographer. And it's, I don't think uh, you can begin to really understand the nature of a photographer's work and contribution to the medium without understanding what that means. Bresson is using the 50 millimeter lens. All of the, let's say, the Italian neorealist filmmakers are using the 50 millimeter lens. Along comes Jean-Luc Godard in uh, 64, I guess, with Breathless, and all of a sudden, the world explodes, it opens up. Not that I'm suggesting that uh, either Gary or Lee or John Tchaikovsky well, saw Breathless. The lenses weren't as good. The lenses what? The wide-angle lenses in those days weren't as good. It weren't as good, which is, you're saying, which is why people didn't use them, or hadn't been using them, yeah. yeah. Or yeah. as why. <laughs> or why. I, I just want to add, I feel closer to athletes than I do to art. He feels closer to athletes than to art. And you know, you look at Gary's picture of the cow's tongue and the cowboy's hat, it's not possible to think about. You know, it's a physical thing. Right, absolutely. Will you say that one more time in the microphone yeah. to the people behind you? What, what do you want me to say? <laughs> Talk about the cow's tongue. Oh, yeah, the cow's tongue is really terrific. I mean, it's not possible to even think of a picture like that. You know, it was, Gar it was Gary's physicality that right. understood right. something. Yeah. You know, he didn't think, say, oh, here's a cow's tongue and a, cow and a cowboy's hat. It was there and he, you know, well, we, don't, we don't think as much as the rest of the world because it's done in a hundredth of a second. Or a thousand. And, yeah, or a thousand, yeah. Which isn't to say, though, that there's great intelligence that you captured. Oh. Um, there, there's a wonderful quote that you've made once about um, wanting to take, take a photograph of your Uncle Vern, but you got the car in the background and the tree behind it, and you said, photography is a generous medium, yeah. right? And so, you know, g he might have just tried to capture the, the hat and yeah. the tongue, but, but somehow the world got in there no besides it. There's no time to it. think. You're, you're right. doing this, you know, you're, you're, you're <laughs> right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I'd like to try to answer the question about America, but it looks like we can't keep our 
minds there, uh, which is symptomatic of what it means that this was America. We still suffer from that hegemonic view of ourselves, but a lot of work about documentary elsewhere has been done over the last few decades that present a very different idea of documentary practices in places other than the absolute center of me metropolis. And since then, of course, the metropolis has ceased to be just New York. Uh, that is, the focus has ceased to be just on New York as the metropolis, but on the entire country and also everywhere else, you know. Despite the problems that Steve Bannon has with it, artists are globalists, non-nationalists, transnationalists, anti-nationalists. We may have a sensibility born of being, as I was saying, perhaps Jews from the Bronx, not Jews from the Bronx, Bronxites, Brooklynites, upper class. Nevertheless, we have, as I guess the quote from Brecht said, you know, realism is what we take, we have learned realism to be. So we bring a sensibility of the, I'm now going to jump to someone else, the Lebensfeld, uh, the life world that Habermas taught us to think about. That's what we bring to define what it is that's worth picturing. And of course, one of the great uh, virtues of these photographers is that they looked outside the grounds of the permissible. I think if we want to say something sets these three people apart, it's precisely that, which we've talked about in different ways, most of which I absolutely disagree with. But nevertheless, I would agree on that. Uh, I'm concerned if we continue this conversation, we're going to miss the, um, the, the historically specific bar that Sarah has ordered um, with seven different types of vermouth. So perhaps should we wrap it up? Thank you again to the three panelists. <laughs>